Um, I will try not to use the microphone because I think my speaking voice is loud enough to reach everybody. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Because between holding my own notes and the clicker, I, I really don't have a third hand. So, uh, Welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to be here. And a thousand thanks to the Polytechnic University for holding this roundtable um, every year. It's a really good platform for some of us uh, to share our thoughts and to have a conversation with the audience. Um, so thank you, Kay. Thank you, Sherry. I think it's the main person who, oh, hi, Sherry. <laughs> Uh, big thanks to the roundtable as well as to the English Language Center uh, for having me. It, it, it's really an honor. Um, uh, every time I talk, I have three goals. And because I'm a business person, because I work for a bank and I have an MBA, I, I, I tend to use acronyms a lot or this sort of punchy things, the three I's. So I aim to be informal and that's why there's a chair here. I want to sit down when I talk so we're at the same eye level. Number two, I want to be interactive. So at any point, you can stop me and ask questions, or you can save the questions to the Q&A at the end. We do have a bit of time for that. And number three, uh, informative. So hopefully you walk away having uh, not learned something, but at least a thought in your head that you can think about uh, and engage with your friends and your students. Uh, just to warm up the audience a little bit, I want to get to know you a little bit. So. By a show of hands, how many of you are instructors? Most of you. That's very intimidating, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how many of you are students? Okay, we have two. <laughs> thank you. Uh, anybody who didn't put up their hand? Okay, so we have one technician who is taping the whole thing. Again, very intimidating. Uh, so great, so most of the audience are, uh, are instructors, so I'll try to tailor the content uh, mostly f uh, toward that group. Um, so a little bit about, I guess, uh, myself beyond the introduction. So I started off as a blogger about nine years ago, and that sort of got a bit of traction, and I started writing uh, as a columnist uh, on current affairs and politics for a number of uh, publications in Hong Kong and overseas, and then turned some of my writings and essays into my first book, and then first book led to second and third, uh, and, and, and a half a dozen anthologies uh, to which I contribute my short stories to author, and then this is sort of the crux of the conversation today, is, is how I went from author to a bit of an activist. And being an activist, you need to continue blogging, and so there's a cycle of life. Um, and today's topic is engaging the illiterate, right? So what does illiterate mean? It means a person who is able to read, because a person who is not able to read is an illiterate. But an illiterate person is a person who is able to read but chooses not to because he or she is not interested in reading. We have a lot of those people in Hong Kong, unfortunately. And, and uh, about four years ago, uh, in 2013, I wrote an essay called The City That Doesn't Read. Uh, it's in my second book. Um, to talk about s or to try to understand why, why we're different from even our fellow Asian, right? If you travel to Japan, if you travel to Korea, you see people reading the paperback on, on the subway, on their version of the MTR. Uh, people still read newspapers and magazines, but in Hong Kong, all you see are people swiping their iPhone or their iPad um, on, on the MTR. Um, so just again, by a show of hand, how many of you have a newspaper subscription? Well done, well done. How many of, oh, thank you. How many of you only read nonfiction? You're not a fiction kind of guy, okay. Um, how many of you don't really like poetry? It's not my thing, I don't get it. <laughs> Honesty is good. Um, how many of you have written, uh, or not written, read three or more books in the past month? Past month, three or more. Okay. How many of you have read three or more books within the past six months? So more people. 
Okay, so this title doesn't really apply to the audience here. You guys are all very intellectually you know, <laughs> stimulated, right? But that's not representative of the general population in Hong Kong. Um, <clears throat> so I was trying to understand how come people don't read? Is it this Einstein space-time continuum in Hong Kong? Because we, we lack both. We don't have space. We don't have time. There's no space for a library. People don't buy books. So they say, oh, I'll read e-books, and they never do, right? I mean, e-book e is just an excuse for not reading. Uh, <laughs> or, or they download the book. They download the book on their you know, a, a Kindle and, and read the first two pages, and then say, well, I've done some reading, right? And never really quite finish the book. So space is an issue. It's a good excuse for people to say, well, I don't have room for physical books, and it just takes up too much space. Or my mom will yell at me if I buy books. Um, or there's time, right? People are stressed out. Who has the time to read? Uh, if you have a full-time job that sort of releases you at 7 or 8 or even 9, 10 p.m., and by the time you go home, you just want to turn on the TV and just, ugh, right? Who has the time to pick up a 1,000-page paperback uh, and start reading? And then there's part of the education system, right? Because Hong Kong is so sort of exam-oriented. You have midterms, you have finals, and uh, internal assessment, uh, your homework. Who has the time to read, especially for students, who have the time to read outside of their text material or the assigned reading? If you do, people will say, well, you're not really focusing on your curriculum, focusing on your academic. You are being distracted by reading. Um, but then I thought the most important factor is none of those things because space and lack of time or lack of space lack of time and also uh, the idea uh, that uh, the education is to learn by rote it, 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 all those factors exist in other countries right in, in Japan in Korea in China but yet somehow Hong Kong is quite different and w the reason that I thought it really comes down to is parenting, upbringing, and the environment. H Hong Kong parents are very good at making the children to th do things that they don't themselves do. <laughs> go take a violin lesson, go learn ballet, go learn Tai Chi or uh, you know, the, the, uh, Kung Fu or something uh, in order to bulk up your resume, right? So, so that you get into better schools but then none of them do any of these things themselves, right? I have parents who are forcing their children to learn German and Spanish because French is already too commonplace, <laughs> right? And so look, knowing English and French won't score you anything extra when you apply to a, 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 a prestigious primary school or secondary school. And so people are now learning Spanish and German, but then they don't, themselves don't speak a word of it or they have no interest in languages. And so the children are just being forced to do something for purely utilitarian reasons, but, but not because it is good uh, you know, that they themselves like it. And, if you, and reading is one of those things that parents force the kids to read. They take them to Bogazine uh, or t to page one in the past uh, and make them sit there and pick a book. Right? Pick a book and buy it and read it at home. Right? And I'm going to ask you about it in a week. But then they look at their parents, and the parents don't read a word. Right? And so there is a bit of double standard hypocrisy there. And so obviously, when the kid grows up, books will then fall by the wayside, just like the violin, just like ballet. Right? We don't see a lot of people still practicing the violin into their adulthood. Um, so those are some of the reasons um, in my essay that I explored to explain uh, or literacy in Hong Kong. So this is a picture I just took yesterday when I walked into Joint Publishing. There's a Joint Publishing bookstore uh, in Central, which is where I work. And then you walk into the bookstore and then boom. The, the first thing you see, economics, finance and investment, business and management, and another business and management bookshelf. This is our bookstore. Right? This is a typical bookstore in Hong Kong where all the books are utility books, they are tool books, right? And the tool books get the front and center, the sort of the marquee area. Whereas, yes, they do carry maybe a couple of airport novels. I mean, that's what I call them, you know, like a John Grisham or, you know, <coughs> no offense to John, <laughs> please don't write him. Uh, but then they get shoved to the back, 
right? So you kind of have to ask the assistant, oh, where are your friction? And then they'll begrudgingly take you to that section where, where you can physically see dust on the shelf. Um, so people don't, so even for the 20% of people who do read, because I had some uh, statistics in my essay, I think about 80% of people don't read regularly. But for the 20% who do read, it depends on what they read also, right? There is a prevailing concept in, in Hong Kong that reading fiction, poetry is a waste of time because it's, you don't learn anything from it, right? You read finance books because then it helps you learn how to invest. You, you read travel books because then you know where to go to Tokyo or to Osaka, what restaurants to go to. Uh, or you read self-help book because that sort of improves your well-being. But anything outside of those th three categories are really a hard sell. And so maybe occasionally you read a history book because then, again, you feel like you learn something about a particular culture or a country. But fiction, right? People generally feel that fiction is not useful. Um, I have a publisher, and I have been with the publisher, uh, the same publisher for the past seven years. And I remember one of the early meetings with him, he has said to me point blank, if you think about fiction, you should talk to someone else, right? Because fiction doesn't sell in Hong Kong. And I don't want to print another title that sells only 200 copies, right? And, and that, that, that really stuck to me. And my publisher is not a terrible person. He's a really nice guy. But, but he, 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 he runs a business, and there are commercial concerns. Um, <clears throat> so. The thing that really sort of surprises me is that we don't have the same approach with movies, right? With movies, nobody in Hong Kong watches a documentary, which is, to me, is the equivalent of a nonfiction, <laughs> right? If you, if you tell a friend or your girlfriend or boyfriend, well, let's go, the, let's spend the weekend watching a documentary, you're like, what? My precious time, I want to watch The Avengers 4, right? <laughs> it's, it's not out until five years later, um, you know? <laughs> But this, so that's sort of drama, that's sort of superhero, that's fiction, right? But, but we don't have the same aversion to fictional movies, right? And so p people take a very different approach because nobody thinks of books as entertainment, right? They think of books as something useful, it's a tool. And, and it's very ingrained uh, in how they think. So that's the current state of things in Hong Kong. Yes. The Hong Kong parents, when they say buy book, yeah. do, do they just guide them towards the tool section or to a fiction uh, section? Obviously, I was generalizing. Not every parent <laughs> is like that. But I, and my personal observation, I've seen parents just sort of drag the kid to a bookstore. Uh, well, actually, nowadays, bookstores are very kids friendly. It's colorful, and so kids will like to go in. And then they say, OK, here, pick a book from the shelf, and, and then we'll the kid will follow and then show the mom the book, and then the mom will say, no, not this one, right? Yes, sometimes the, the school will have a recommended extra reading, and so they'll go to the bookstore looking for it, but other time, parents really do want the, the, the children to be immersed in the book culture because they know it's good for them. Um, and so they do take them to the bookstore and then say, choose the book, and then they will vet it, right? Because invariably, the kid will pick something really fun with pop-up, you know, uh, but then only five pages, and they're cardboard pages that this stick. And parents feel, oh, no, 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 that's, that's, not, that's not a real book, right? I, I want you to read the abridged version of, you know, Charles Dickens' Hard Times, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, okay, so why do we read? Right, so that's the next question. So we know we don't read. The question is, how do we convince them to read? So it takes us back to the question, why do we read? So any idea? Entertainment, yes, I talked about that. What? Words, right? So we want to have a relationship with words, okay? Imagination, yes, it does sort of text freedom, it takes us to places we've never been to, to a time period we've never experienced, to characters we've never run into in life. Escape from reality. Escape, yeah, escapism, right? That's sort of movies, like watching The Avengers, right? <clears throat> uh, yes, all of those are very 
good answer. So, so knowledge and entertainment and relationship with words. But I am a lawyer, right? I'm a lawyer by trade, and so I have my lawyer's take on things. To me, the reason why we read, yes, it's, it's all of those things that we've already talked about, but it's more than that. It's, it's about the way we think. It trains us to be more patient. It lengthens our attention span. It allows us to learn critical thinking, independent thinking. Uh, allow us to learn how to analyze the situation, how to interpret the story, right? Because when you read fiction, it's never just about the words on the pages, but what message the author is trying to tell me. The character, sure, they met and fell in love and then they ate poison and died, but what is he, what is he or she really trying to say, right? It is that sort of decoding, that interpretation that forces us to really think and reflect and analyze and discuss, engage with our friends and discuss with them, well, this is what I think, but what do you think, right? And ultimately, it gives us the P word, right? Perspective. It gives us perspective on life. <clears throat> and, and, and so, it, to me, it's all a matter of affecting the way we think, our way of thinking, and our way of looking at the world. So reading is more just about soft, uh, it's, it's much more about soft skills than cold facts or hard knowledge. And that takes me to sort of the point <clears throat> I, wanted, I really wanted to make is that our literacy is, in, especially in our current political environment, it is a form of self-censorship, right? <clears throat> and what do I mean by that? If you think of whoever is running our city, right? Not entirely popular, right? We don't even know who is actually running our city, right? They could be further north, right? What do you think they count on, right? They, they count on a disarmed public. People who don't really care, just want to go to the movies, just want to maybe shop a little bit, travel to Japan and Korea when I have time, not really pay attention to anything. Right? It's the same thing in the US, same thing in Europe, you know, to some extent. Right? A lot of politicians count on you not paying attention so that they can just slide a quick one under the... <clears throat> right? And so they can get away with things. Right? So what better way to disarm the public by having people who are easily distracted, by having people who are easily confused. Right? There's so much fake news and alternative facts and all that people who have a short attention span, people who respond only to sound bites, people who are not in the habit of just generally taking the time, looking at something, looking at an issue, go a little bit deeper, scratch beneath the surface, and have a little of a thinking, discussion with friends, and come to a conclusion, which is all of the things that we talked about, what reading can help you develop. Right? So, what better ways for whoever is running our city to disarm the public by creating a public that doesn't really understand issues or stay on topic long enough for them for real changes to happen? Case in point, this is what they want. Right? These are the easiest people to govern because no one would ever speak up, no matter what you do. Okay, so here's two sort of real life examples. It's, it's a little hard to read, I know, uh, or, or make out the picture. Do you know who this person is? Eddie Chu? He's one of the Lechko lawmaker. He made a lot of noise about six months ago about the Northeast ter uh, News Territory development. Right, there's an area called uh, Wang Chao, right? And he was the one who first said, well, I think there's a lot of collusion between the government and the local Hungry Cook and the pro Beijing <laughs> camp and some of the local organized crime triads, right? And then he received 
a death threat, caused a lot of outrage. He was really getting a lot of traction with this issue. That happened September 2016, right? It hasn't been that long, maybe seven months now, eight months. Nobody's talking about this. Nobody. What happened since that story came out? We had Oathgate, right? <coughs> Two firebrand lawmakers played with the oath and insulted China. They got disqualified. All of that took away all the attention, right? So nine months later, nobody talks about Northeast. I don't even know what the government is doing, right? Not only did we, the public, take the foot off the off the gas pedal, the press too. The press not covering this. Right. Another example, Hong Kong Free Press, an online media I write for, they were banned from all gov covering all government uh, news conferences, announcements. They are a legit news agency just like any other, but they're independent. Independent means they don't rely on, on government or advertisers' funding, they rely on crowdfunding, so there's no way the government can control them. Not by putting pressure on advertisers, not by uh, you know, it's, uh, it's controlling the funding that they give them, not like RTHK, right? So government doesn't like that, Beijing doesn't like it, banned, barred from covering, right? So, so this happened when? March 2017, and then the uh, Hong Kong uh, Journalists Association issued a strongly worded you know, press release condemning the, uh, the, the announcement by the government. It has only been two months. Is anybody talking about this? Nobody, right? So here we have, it's just the tip of the iceberg, only two out of probably hundreds of news stories that have been buried because we don't have the attention span to stay on topic, right? Bec but are these not important anymore? Has the situation improved and changed and so we can say, oh, well, I think we can move on? No, things are, if anything else, if, if anything, things are only getting worse, right? So this is sort of how I, I tie the two together, right? Sh sh illiteracy. The, the, the decision, the refusal to read or to, to engage leads to a lack of civil and political engagement and it, it plays right into the hands of those who are running the city. Okay, so obviously we can sit here and or nod and say, oh, terrible, 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 he has a point, yes, yes, we mustn't let this happen. But it's no good if we can't do anything about it, right? So let's talk about some of the ways we can change. <clears throat> so to me, communication is a two-way street, right? So I'm the content provider because I'm the writer or I'm the columnist, and then there's the people who receive it, right? So I use the metaphor of how do you make your children eat vegetables, right? So do you, do you convince them, son, listen? It's good for you. <laughs> Celery is good for you. <laughs> Broccoli is good for you. It would never help. It won't work, right? Because that, so keep telling people, the public, that reading is good for you will not do anything, right? The only thing to make your kids eat green vegetables is by making it delicious. I'm sorry, that's the only way. If you boil celery, that's disgusting. If you hard boil broccoli to the degree that it's like soft and mushy and there's no taste, it's disgusting and no wonder kids don't eat vegetables, right? So think about ways to mix things up, maybe use different spices or change the shape. Uh, I know one parent who tell the kids that you know, Brussels sprouts look like turtle and so it's sort of fun to eat and so they play around with it with a fork and then they woo, fit into the mouth. And so you have to come up with ways to engage your children to sort of, instead of convincing them that a vegetables are good for them, you find ways to improve the dish. And so that's some of the things I want to talk about, right? So how we improve our content and secondarily how we, how writers can rethink our role. Okay, so how do we improve our content? So again, this is sort of my MBA 
coming out. So all sort of CAM, CAM, you know, whatever. <laughs> credibility, accessibility, and marketability. So credibility is it doesn't help that or you, you you might have this great motivation to write and to change the world or to improve the city, but it's, it won't help if your stuff is not good, right? And what do I mean by good? Good doesn't mean that it's sort of beautiful and colorful and stuff, but, but good means it's credible, right? The, the consistency in quality, consistency in uh, defendability, that you can defend your arguments, especially in the world of, in, in, in the age of fake news and alternative facts, and consistency in your political stance, right? You can't flip-flop all the time because it is things like that that make you sort of lose credibility. And then consistency in timing, regularity is very important. People, if you tell people that it's a bi-monthly column, then you better put out something every two weeks, right? Because over time people feel like, well, I check back, there's nothing new, and then they move on to the next site. And consistency in focus, right? You can one day post a picture of your dinner, right, next to a serious topic about, you know, the electrical election, right? So people come to your site with the clear expectations of what they would get from you because they have limited time and you auto deliver. And then there's accessibility. So it, it doesn't help even if your stuff is good, credible, if it's hard to understand, right? So by a show of hand, who knows how many LegCo members we have? Okay, one gentleman. He might lie because I'm not gonna <laughs> tell him, uh, ask him how many. Uh, okay, how many? Excellent. Next, next question will be harder. Can someone explain, me, uh, explain to me what the separate vote count work, or how does that work? Because, okay, same gentleman, <laughs> right? But the rest of you, you may, you may have I, an idea, you may have heard about that term separate vote count, uh, reading in the SCMP or something, but you don't really have a clear idea. Same thing with the readers, right? So if you write this amazing analysis about the upcoming electrical election, you talk about how the existing system is unfair because the 70 seats are divided into uh, geographic constituencies and functional constituencies and functional constituencies have a way to veto you know, decisions passed by uh, you know, LESCO because of the separate vote count. Nobody will get it, right? People have limited time, they just move on and say, oh, this is woof, over my head, right? M moving on to the next thing. Right? So your article or whatever contribution, piece of writing that you put out, needs to be digestible and accessible to the extent that a regular person can understand. And it's maybe a particular point and point for academic, right? Because people in academia tend to think that I don't pander, right? I didn't know. It cheapens my piece if I explain too much, right? <laughs> or I, I, you know, I spend time, you know, footnoting, I have to put together the, you know, bibliography in the back. I, I don't have time to explain what a you know, separate vote count is, right? There's a bit of that tension, right? Or if I write too popular a piece, then, well, ooh, excuse me, right? <laughs> I'm an academic, right? I, 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 I'm not into sound bites, so I don't care my title is two, two sentences long, right? <laughs> or I don't really have an opening hook that get people to read my article because that's not how I write, that's not who I am. Right? Academic writing is not like that. Right? And I have a reputation to keep up. Right? So th there's a bit of that tension going on. So it, it depends. If you want to engage the public, unfortunately you do have to sort of make your information, make your material a little bit more digestible, a little bit more accessible. You have to have a clear message. People who come and read your article or your piece need to know, right? Or, or you, you need to constantly ask yourself, why should someone care? Why should, someone be, why should anyone be reading this, right? And, and in your, I, I know there's a lot of admin work at the university. One of the things that you probably have to ask to do is to write a report for your course. 
right? And on that report, maybe even on the front page, you have to identify by the end of the course, students will learn A, B, C, and D, right? Everybody has to do that, right? Think about that for your own article. By the end of your article, my reader should be able to learn or, or have achieved the following things. <coughs> Right? And use plenty of examples, use plenty of photographs and diagrams, right? I remember when I wrote my latest book two years ago, Umbrellas in Bloom, because I had to chronicle the Occupy movement, and so much about the Occupy movement is about the political reform that failed, right? And how Beijing issued uh, an announcement that basically un undo all of the consultation, right? And so inevitably I have to explain the political system in Hong Kong and how it's not a full democracy. It's really boring stuff. I don't want people to pick up my book, open the first page or the first chapter and realize, oh my God, right? Who's ever gonna read this? So I actually went on amazon.com, order a whole bunch of popular math books, right? Popular math is a genre in and out of itself. It's sort of, it's catered for non-mathematicians who are into math, like a geek like me, right? <laughs> but then it's, it's, there's not a lot of formulas, it's not narrative, storytelling. So I bought a, a, about three popular math books and I read them because I want to learn how uh, an experienced author can, can turn something so esoteric, so difficult to understand like relativity, right? Like, I don't know other math topics, but whatever the math <laughs> topics is, turn it into something that you can say, oh, that's kind of cool, right? The book's like the story of Pi. It talks about how Pi is being used in so many different applications throughout history across cultures. Those are wonderful books. And so I wanted to acquire that skill. So before I wrote Umbrellas in Bloom, I did that, learned from them, and I wrote the first section of the book about Hong Kong politics in such a way that people sort of maybe uh, much more engaged or have a giggle because I put in a joke. <clears throat> and so things like that would go a very long way. And Finally, marketability. So it doesn't matter if your writing is extremely credible, stands on all four, very firm ground, or very accessible, very easy to understand, if nobody knows about it, right? So you have to get it out there, right? In order to get it out there, instead of complaining that people swipe the iPhone, iPad all the time, they only do Facebook, Right? Instead of fearing that trend, because it's not going to change, use it to your advantage. Right? So talk about your writing on, on social media. For Christ's sake, have a Twitter account. Right? People are so resistant to Twitter or to Instagram because Instagram is only for food or something or for <laughs> travels. But what's stopping you from posting a screenshot of your article on Instagram? You never know what happens. It's like tossing a bottle into the ocean. One day it might come back. Um, so talk about, uh, talk about your, your writing on social media. It's going to generate some buzz among your friends and it gets shared. It's a really good starting point. And then work with the media. I mean, the media needs content, right? Submit an article for crying out loud. It's not a big deal, right? If you have written something that you think, well, it's pretty good. I think people can benefit from it. Send it in, right? What's the worst thing that happened? It get rejected or, you know, then you try again, but that's how good things happen, right? Work with bookstores. Bookstores are a great partner for writers, right? And they also need re excuses to draw more readers in, to get more traffic, right? And so offer to do a book signing, offer to do a little talk at a bookstore, right? Uh, one of my friends, uh, one of my poet friends, Nicholas Wong, I'm not sure if you guys know him, he recently launched, well, two days ago, launched a campaign to sell poetry in order to save a bookstore, uh, right? So there is a Chinese language a bookstore in Hong Kong being evicted by, by the landlord because they jacked up the price. And so he partnered, uh, my friend Nicholas partnered with the bookstore to say, well, I'm going to write a bunch of new poems. I'm going to sell them online. Whatever proceeds, I'm going to uh, donate it to the bookstore so you can stay in business. Things that is very clever, right? Because it not only helped the bookstore, obviously it does, but it also helped his own name, right? Obviously he didn't do it for self-promotion, but as sort of a byproduct of what he's doing, he also get his name out there. <coughs> 
and work with the university, right? So we're all in academia, engage your students, share your writing with your students, talk about, if, if, if it's relevant, talk about your stuff in school, uh, in class, and maybe even offer the university or the faculty that you want to give a free talk or something on a topic that you care a lot about. <clears throat> One of the things maybe you can tell me, you can tell is that I, I, I love talking. I, I, I love engaging with the audience, and so I always offer uh, to give free talks and guest lectures, uh, and you know, and that's why I'm here today because it's a really good way to reach people, sort of one audience at a time, right? Uh, but you have to start somewhere. When I travel, right, after I booked a trip in, in my hotel, which is usually two, three months in advance because you don't want to pay last minute fare, the next thing I do, research, well-known universities in Barcelona, <laughs> send them an email. I do it all the time. I'm the author of Umbrellas in Bloom. I would love to come in and give a guest lecture on political development in Hong Kong. Most people are very receptive, right? Why, you know, why not? You're not charging them. And it is a good way for you to sort of give some international perspective to their students. It's a win-win, really. Right? So think about things like that. Just get yourself out there. <coughs> Which is a good segue to the next prong of my two-prong strategy, which is rethinking our role. My first image of a writer as a kid was someone who hunched over the typewriter in some dark cabin in, in the forest or something, right? Unfortunately, that is no longer the case, especially in Hong Kong when the readership is small, when the city itself is very small. Writers are increasingly called upon to do a bit more, right? Writers have to market their own books, right? We don't have big publishers like Simon and Schuster to take us on a world tour, right? So a lot of the time you have to connect with venues and bookstores in order to get your book out there. So writers need to come out of the shell a little bit and into the front line and, you know, really stand for something. So these are some of the organizations that I work with regularly. I, I, I know I go a little overboard. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I tend to sort of bite more than I can chew. Um, <clears throat> but this is an idea of some of the things that you could do because there are two issues that are really close or near and dear to my heart. Number one is the freedom of expression. Number two is foreign domestic workers, because nobody cares about them in Hong Kong, not the local politicians anyway. So I joined groups like Pen Hong Kong, which I co-founded, uh, to promote literature and defend the freedom of expression. I'm a member of the Progressive Lawyers Group, which again, you know, engages a lot of the political issues. And then I work with organizations like Health for Domestic uh, workers, Pathfinders, uh, Room to Read, and all of, uh, and Wimler, all of those are uh, NGOs that either help the domestic worker community or uh, promote literacy. Um, then I, I teach law at HKU and I write for the SCMP, Hong Kong Free Press, and um, EJ Insight. So these are some of the organizations I work with. It's not easy because time commitment is really a big thing in Hong Kong and I have a full-time job and I can only sort of devote so much time. Sometimes you also risk your career a little bit, right? People worry about reprisals, people worry about political pressure. And as if that's not bad enough, it's a bit of a thankless job, right? I mean, people do appreciate what you do, but there's a lot of sort of politics within the organization sometimes and uh, you know if you promise something you know deadline approaches or you know it, there can be conflict and so it's things that you you really need to manage the good news is the reward is tremendous not in terms of financial reward I know we're in Hong Kong but it's not always about money uh, personal fulfillment, just satisfaction that you're making, even a very small difference, uh, is what 
keeps you going. Uh, that you are doing something for a place, for a city that you genuinely love and care about and want to be better. And there are, because Hong Kong is a small pool, right? You feel a slightly like a bigger fish, right? And so it's easy. There's a lot of opportunities out there. If only you reach out and volunteer your time. Right? You will find a lot of open arms and say, oh my god, we have been waiting for a volunteer for a long time with your skill set. Thank you very much for reaching out. And the second piece of good news is you don't always have to get physically involved. You can involve by making a donation. There's always crowdfunding initiatives. You can get involved by e even just sharing links on your Facebook post, uh, on your Facebook wall. Or just by engaging your friends and your students by telling them, oh, you know what? Help for domestic workers is a really good organization, right? Why don't you find out more about it? Or, you know, Hong Kong Free Press relies on clicks and eyeballs, so why don't you add that, add the page to your Facebook, follow them, and get informed that way. So before I open the floor to q and A. I just want to sort of uh, summarize some of the salient points. I still sort of the New York subway system slogan, which is if you see something, say something. I mean, that's after 9-11. Uh, the idea is if you see a backpack not being picked up, left on the seat, it could be a bomb. So alert law enforcement so they can do something about it, right? So if you see something, say something. That applies to writers as well. If you see something that's socially uh, unjust, that is wrong, say something and also do something about it. Right? Complaining is fun, complaining is cathartic, right? <clears throat> but it, 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 at some point you ought to ask yourself, well, that's all negative. What positive contribution can I make? And the second closing thought is technology won't change, right? We won't go back to the old age where we, we, we all read physical books. There's no Facebook to distract people. It's too late. It's irreversible, right? We are where we are. You may as well, instead of fear it, use it to your advantage, right? So as I mentioned before, share your writing or share your thoughts on Facebook and engage your friends. Um, and finally, uh, the CAM acronym, right? So credible, accessible, and marketable. And on accessibility, we just have to think, have our audience in mind, write something that's easily digestible and accessible to them. That's the only way to change minds. So that's my little talk. I hope I'm on time. Uh, so Q&A. It doesn't have to be a question, it can be a thought. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. I found that very interesting. I, I mean, I'm a writer too, and I think, I wonder, in, ce in celebrating writing, I wonder if we overemphasize the importance of writing. But maybe there are two things here. I think writing is excellent for analysis and for in-depth understanding. But is there, a, is there another step that comes before that um, which is awareness. So people have to be aware of an issue before they want to learn uh, more about it. Yeah. And writing competes with other means. I mean, you said it yourself about you know, the, 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 um, uh, the lack of focus, the, 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 the scattered brain culture. Um, I mean, there are cartoons, there, are, there is. Video games, games. yes. Um, yeah, video games. There are all kinds of ways of raising people's awareness and consciousness. Yeah. Important issues yeah. that don't involve writing. Right. I mean, maybe writing um, is, is more useful at, another, at the second stage. You know, yeah. Learning more and analysis. Yeah. More. yeah. Well, my response is sort of common sense. I think everybody would probably react the same way. Number one, I think we have to start somewhere. Yeah. Right? I think we. W and what is the alternative? The alternative is what to give up and say, well, books are sort of you know, old news, and so let, let, let's just move on. 
I, I don't think we're there yet, right? Maybe 25, 30, 100 years later, yes, but at this point, I don't think we're there yet, and the fight is still worth fighting, right? And I, so I'm not ready to go to the sort of nuclear option and say, no, I, I will stop because writing is so archaic, writing is just so, so uh, not with today's a generation. Plus, I think it's a learning process, right? Over time, if you s immerse a person in, wor in the written word, they will turn around. And I read a really e encouraging article in either the New York Times yesterday that, you know, for the, f for the past two years, the sale of paper books have actually, you know, exceeded e-books, right? So people do come around. Right? Maybe we'll go the way of the vinyl records, right? That yes, it's not the primary medium anymore, but it's kind of cool to have a record player at home. Yeah, right. It's not mutually exclusive. It's not mutually exclusive. So I think uh, we can continue to have faith in the written word, um, and and like you said at the beginning, that I mean, it's it's beautiful writing, you know. <laughs> to celebrate. Word is not just utility, but it's also a form of art, right? There's so much beauty in it. Like any form of art, lack of exposure is the number one you know, barrier. The reason why a kid doesn't want to go to an art museum is because I don't get this Picasso painting because it's so weird and, and I don't know what it depicts. But that's why you bring them. You keep bringing them to the museum. At some point, they realize, oh my god, that's, that is worth $5 million, and that's catch their attention. And then they will do a little bit more research. And, and from then on, they move on to other painters and so on. Same thing with writing. Right? The first time you pick up Shakespeare's Hamlet, oh, I don't get it. Then start with something easier and, and, you know, and create an environment of reading. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And then where you can have like a very long path with beautiful hubs and they invite even artists or writers, they have some galleries. Yeah. And then it's like a family fun fair yeah. for you to explore yeah, 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 yeah. forms of writing or books that you would like to engage with. Yeah. And if we can create some space like this kind of fun fair for writing, for reading in Hong Kong, like in some beautiful areas like this Castle Bay. Yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You can't keep telling your students that you know Shakespeare is g good for you, right? You know, because he is the father of the English language. He, I mean, so many references came from his plays. It doesn't mean anything if they don't enjoy the process, right? So it's again like eating vegetables. You have to make the dish delicious. Just by telling them that broccoli is nutritious really doesn't help, right? So that example is a really good example, right? So how do you make Shakespeare fun, right? By sort of creating an environment where it's beautiful to look at, there's houses, physical establishments that people can have, have a dialogue with or can imagine, visualize what it was like many years ago, you know, in, in, in Victoria times, how, how how the plays are being done. Yes, things like that will go a very long way. I recently got into Cantonese opera, because right? I love Italian opera. All my friends know that. But then I realized, oh, you know what? Why am I spending so much time on faraway cultures when right at home, there's this rich, amazing source of inspiration and art form that I'm not exploring. And so I started looking into it, and I started listening to it every single day, and it's beautiful, it's brilliant. Right? And then I went to the bookstore. I, I talked to the assistant and I said, well, I would like, to, I would like you to show me uh, where the Chinese opera books are because I want to understand the history a little bit more, understand you know, uh, the creative process and all of that stuff. The person said, oh, well, let me look. I'm sorry, we don't have a book. I was expecting a shelf. There's not a single book. Right? I, I was so shocked. I'm like, this can't be. It must be because you're a small bookstore, right? 
And then he said, well, no, sir, this is our system, right? So it's not just what we have in stock here. And, and, and so right then, I said, okay, mental note must write books on Cantonese <laughs> opera, <laughs> right? But then that, that really saddens me, right? Hong Kong is the, is the birth, is, is the cradle for Cantonese opera, and yet nobody pays attention to it. It's a crime. It really is a crime, right? So things like that. So reading is not the only art form being slowly neglected, but there are others as well, and, and they deserve our equal attention. Yes? I think it's, I think it's a question of media. Mm. Um, I find, you know, like, you should have picked a real travel to work on public transport on, on the MTR. And it goes in cycles. When I first came to Hong Kong, um, people would, let's say, be reading a newspaper. If they weren't reading a newspaper, maybe a book, but mostly people just either asleep or staring into the space. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and then that's now developed into a, into a smartphone where people are staring at the smartphone. But yeah. they're reading. Yes. They may be reading a book, they may be reading a newspaper. I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, yes, yes. A no, I absolutely agree, and that is absolutely true in the U.S., where the Kindle is very voyeuring, you know, <laughs> looking into what people are reading. Well, okay, really, just by an informal poll, 80% video games. Right? It, it, before, it was Candy Crush, and then there's Pokemon, and then there's now other games I don't know about. Uh, yes, but there are people who read the Apple Daily online, there are people who read Hong Kong Free Press online, on the subway, but really they are the minorities. Uh, and I, because I'm old school, I really think there is a difference between reading words from a page than reading words from an electronic a device. I think the retention is very different. There has been scientific uh, studies done about it that people don't remember as much from an electronic medium as they do from a paper medium. Um, and when it comes to staying on topic, right, retention is very important. Right? Because if you don't remember the, the, the news article about Eddie Chu that you read six months ago because you read it very quickly on an electronic device instead of a, a physical newspaper, then it matters. Right? So I, I'm not totally rejecting the, the electronic medium as sort of uh, a, re, you know, I mean, a repudiation of what we do. Uh, and, and I do get that a lot of people prefer reading online because it's, it's searchable too. I mean, that's brilliant, right? right? <coughs> How many times have you read a thick novel, there's a name comes up and you say, well, is this a new person? And then you want to search for that name and find out the relationship. Yeah, exactly. So, it's a much more rewarding experience Well, I think rewarding is a personal word. Uh, 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 no, but I, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not rejecting the electronic medium. I think it's brilliant. Uh, maybe the answer is that the two are not mutually exclusive, right? Just because you read your Kindle doesn't mean that you need to reject the paperback. Just because you read the paperback like I do, I need to reject, right? Uh, I, I, I would love to carry a Kindle when I travel on a short a weekend trip, right? Then I can select the books based on my mood that day rather than being stuck with the paperback that I realized I really don't like 10 pages. How am I going to get through the other 600, right? So I get that. Um, so again, maybe the answer is not mutually, not mutually exclusive. Why not both? <laughs>